Our next briefer's passion is taking care of people with a focus on building meaningful connections and relationships formed on trust, mutual respect, open communication, collaboration, appreciating differences, and working together to achieve success. He's an Air Force adjunct contract professor, executive coach, resilient team builder, and leadership consultant, whose career in the Air Force culminated as the command senior enlisted leader for United States Transportation Command. Chiefs, please rise and give a warm welcome to Jason France. All right, y'all. And a good morning to everybody. Can everybody hear me in the back? We all good? Well, I would like to start with taking just a moment to recognize the greatness in the room. Look around, Chiefs. I know you've heard this before, but congratulations. I wish you all the best on your journey as a Chief Master Sergeant. Really pay attention to the people that you're sharing this experience with because you will be on this journey as a Chief Master Sergeant with this group in the room, some of you for a very long time. Some of you might not realize where that journey can take you very quickly. And I want to frame this with a story about Chief Master Sergeant Bass and a few of us that served together back in Fort Bragg, North Carolina and Pope Air Force Base in the early 2000s. At that time, Tech Sergeant Jason France, Tech Sergeant Joe Bass, Tech Sergeant Khalith Wright, Tech Sergeant CZ Lopez, Tech Sergeant Anthony Green from the Expeditionary Center, Tech Sergeant Terry Green, Ma I'm sorry, Master Sergeant Terry Green, our previous Air Mobility Command Command Chief, Chief Master Sergeant Higginbotham from Defense Intelligence Agency, was a tech sergeant at the time. None of us at that time serving together at the same place at the same time would have ever imagined where our journey would take us and the impact that we would have on the lives of so many. And wow, what a ride it has been. Thank you so much, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force for allowing me this opportunity to come share a perspective as a joint leader. I had the privilege of serving at Joint Special Operations Command as a tech sergeant and a master sergeant at the tactical and strategic level. And what an honor it was to culminate a career serving as the command senior enlisted leader of United States Transportation Command. And that gave me the opportunity to view our service and all services through a different lens. And today I want to share with you some of that experience to help you. Now, I got some notes up here because it's great to go on the last day because I got to wrap up and capture some of the things. I paid very close attention to your questions to try to think where your head's at. And yes, we are going to talk about joint leadership. And yes, I tell stories and I share examples of things that I have experienced. I ask, even though many of you, most of you, will not have the opportunity to serve in a joint assignment, this is really about you. This is tying in the things that we talked about this week. This is tying in the things that my brother Todd just talked about. This is tying in great power competition. This is tying in the things that our Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force and our Chief of Staff spoke to you about this week. Again, I enjoy telling stories but I ask you to find yourself in these. I promise you'll be able to find yourself in these and through some of these examples that I'm going to share with you today. Now, I'm up here wearing a gray suit. All my suits are blue, too. The only reason I am not wearing a blue suit is because I knew Todd was going to go before me. And since I am representing the joint community, I'm not sure I made a wide choice or a wise choice, but I went with purple instead. So um, thanks, brother, for wearing that blue suit. I still bleed blue, but today we're going to talk a little bit about the purple. So some of the things I'm also going to talk about today, we, we talk about the why a lot. I'm going to talk about that second why and that third why as we tie in many of the things that we talked about this week for the Air Force, what that means in the joint community when you don't have to worry about service responsibilities and some of the things that I'll talk about. What that second, the importance of that second and that third why 
behind some of the things that the Air Force is doing. I am not going to talk about doctrine today. I am not going to talk about theory. We're going to talk about things that hopefully you will get some use out of. I'm going to talk about you know, the Joint Senior Enlisted Leader, you. Some observations, some, some resources, and then I hope to have some time for a little bit of discussion. But first, we're going to start with your greatest value to the organization. And please, I see a few, feel free to take pictures, feel free to you know, do whatever you want with this stuff. Your greatest value to the organization. And I'm going to start, we talk a lot about emotional intelligence, but I want to frame this with talking about the things that come before emotional intelligence. That technical intelligence, those knowledge, skills, those things that you did as a young person, those things that your airmen and your NCOs do, those things that got you here, very transactional in nature. You do something. You're really good at it. You get rewarded for that. You get promoted for that. Chiefs, you don't live there anymore. Some may choose to dip into that from time to time, which is good. You still need to understand these things. But we don't live there anymore. Cognitive intelligence, as you progress, that's where you can analyze things. When you can make good decisions, when you can solve problems, that's also a very important skill. But again, Chiefs, you don't live there anymore. Where you live is right here. And you're going to have a briefing on emotional intelligence today. I don't want to call it a buzzword or a catchphrase, but we talk a lot about it. I hear a lot about it. And it's very important that you understand what it is and dig into it. Because your greatest value to the organization, whether that's joint or as a chief master sergeant in the Air Force, that's where you need to live, right there. Now, when we talk about emotional intelligence, sometimes it's a little bit challenging because our comfort zone, what got you here is not going to keep you here. You've heard that before. You've also heard, I don't know how many times, that as a chief, you're going to have to think about things a little bit differently. Well, this is true. When we talk about the importance of emotional intelligence, it's about that connection with the people that are doing the mission. It's about those relationships, not really to get things done for you, but to get things done for your airmen, and most importantly, to affect mission outcomes. Now, sometimes we correlate those between serving at the tactical level, the operational level, and the strategic level. Well, you all are going to be serving at all of those different positions. Some of you will have the opportunity to serve at the strategic level. But that doesn't mean you can't be a leader that leverages their emotional intelligence in most of the things that you do. Part of being an emotionally intelligent leader is also understanding that you probably are no longer the best person in the room at many things. Now our young people, they are typically the best at those things. Chiefs, you need to get used to being the second best, the third best, the fourth best at things, but knowing who to go to and who is the best to do that and keep yourself up here in, uh, in that level. Now, the important piece as a leader with this is also your people need to see you operating at that level. You've heard many examples about time, about our great power competition, about 2029, I'm sorry, about 2030 and 2049. All right, those tech sergeants right now are going to be those chiefs in 2030. Fifth graders are going to be the chiefs of 2049. Those young people, our young airmen, our tech sergeants right now, need to see you operating at that particular level. All right, now some opportunities. We're going to talk about development. You need to grow this. You need to build up that emotional intelligence capacity. And again, you guys are going to have a briefing on that. You are the ones that are responsible for this growth. No one is going to give that to you. You need to know yourself. 
You need to know what triggers you. Chiefs, as an emotionally, <laughs> as a leader that's operating at EI, it's not going to serve you well to go old school chief style, lean in on somebody and give them that knife hand. It is simply not going to work. Chiefs, at this point, if you have not already done so, it's a good idea to identify what those triggers are and what might get you fired up. Now, I will go against what General Brown said. If you're a two in this area, don't give up. <laughs> Keep on building that up. This is one of those things that you don't want to give up on as far as that, knowing what your triggers are, knowing what sets you off. And sometimes that's hard to control. And I'll give you an example of where emotional intelligence helped me out when what I really wanted to do is kind of lose my cool. All right, so when I first took the position at United States Transportation Command, one of the first things I did was take it up to the Pentagon and sit down with all the service senior enlisted advisors. Most of them have rotated out except one, our Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. But as I went around and spent time with them, one in particular I had some pretty significant differences with. And I knew that we were going to have a stressed and challenging relationship during our time together. He has since retired, and there's a new one in the seat, and the relationship was great. But when I walked in, he looked at me a certain type of way because I was an airman. And I know this. He said, Jay, when I go out and you and I spend some time on the road, I might show a little bit of emotion if we share a stage. I might actually yell at you a little bit because it's important for me to send that message to my soldiers. Oops, I just messed up and said who it was. And my initial reaction was to fight back a little bit because of the way he was viewing me because of my service and what United States Transportation Command did as a service provider, some might say. And I was like, well, you know, that, that is one approach. And inside, I was, I was pretty fired up. But I made the decision to keep my cool and said, hey, how do you think that your people are going to view you when you take that approach, and I remain calm on stage, and I outmaneuver you in the emotional intelligence space by providing facts and data and keeping a cool head and sharing information that is valuable to them without losing my cool or showing some emotion that is absolutely unnecessary. To see two senior leaders in the Department of Defense treat each other like that and, you know, our relationship stayed what it was, but I hope and I believe, you know, it, it's, uh, it caused a little bit of time for pause and reflection. And I was still pretty fired up about it. But when I walked out of there, I realized how important it was and where it could have gone if I would not have taken that approach. Chiefs, you will have opportunities like that. Maybe not in the joint world, maybe not serving it a level of, you know, at a combatant command or some of the other positions um, that you might fill, but that is important when you think about the people that you represent in some of these positions, whether joint or not. How will you handle disagreement and criticism as a chief master sergeant in the Air Force or in the joint community? You're not going to be delivering all good news. You could be in the public spotlight. And you could have to answer some very emotional questions about some emotional topics. And how you choose to respond to those is very, very important. Understanding those things and how you're going to deal with that before you get there will serve you well. All right, now let's talk a little bit about understanding the operating environment. Now, when we talk about guidance, You've heard a lot about reading the National Defense Strategy, the National Military Strategy, 
understanding doctrine, understanding the plans that you support when you go into a joint organization, really not that much different than when you take an organization as a senior enlisted leader, as a chief in the United States Air Force. But also taking that guidance and understanding and interpreting what it means to you, what it, most importantly, what it means to your people, and what you're going to do with it. Not just reading it for the sake of reading it, but looking at it and seeing what you need to do to shape the environment where your people thrive as a leader. Now, when we talk about world events, you heard KP talk about strategic competition, great power competition. Also taking a look at what our adversaries are doing, what the world environment is presenting you, and looking at it through the lens, or looking at it through the lens of what is the adversary doing? How does the adversary view us? How is that adversary going to disrupt us? And what can I do? How do I need to shape my messaging and my engagement with the folks within my organization? Now, I'll give you a couple U.S. Transportation Command examples of how I took this and how I viewed the world. And we'll start with China. And there are many examples that we can use with what China is doing that impacts United States Transportation Command's ability to project and sustain combat forces around the globe. And I'll take the Africa example right now. When you look at the country of Africa and what China is doing in there with going into Africa, supporting the countries of Africa, with building infrastructure, with doing other things, establishing relationships, very high likelihood that at some point they could impede our nation's ability to project. That is one of the few advantages we have right now over China, is our ability to project. And that is based on our partnerships with nations that allow us access basing and overflight, and the opportunity to use their ports. There's not a lot of airstrips in Africa right now and we are competing for partnerships with the countries in Africa. We're competing with China. And I would offer that in many cases, they are doing a far better job than us. So what did that mean to me as the com command senior enlist enlisted leader of United States Transportation Command? As I go out and shape the narrative and talk about these things, what you talk about as a chief master sergeant whether you realize it or not, is important to your people. You talk about it, it's important to you, it's going to be important to them. And to shape that narrative and get your people's level of understanding up there on what our adversaries' actions and what's going on in the world, what that means to your people, is hugely important. And that's just one example as well. We can also talk about China with their investments in ports. What China is doing right now through some of our global choke points, the, the Strait of Hormuz, Bab el Mandeb, the Suez and the Panama Canal, what China is doing is buying up property that surrounds these things and preventing the United States from having the ability to grow and scale and increase the capability of those areas. Now, that's, of course, what we call gray zone competition. But why is that important for you to know as a senior enlisted leader? When you have the opportunity to engage with your partners in the other services and the other organizations in which you support, to be able to shape a narrative and explain to them the why behind the things that you do in your organization is hugely important. Or I can use another example of Russia, because we haven't talked much about Russia this, year, uh, this week. When we look at ability, and again, these are stories. Find yourself in this. Find your unit in this. When we look at Russia and we look at our mobility in the Air Force, I'll use an Air Force example. You know, we have 455 aerial refueling platforms. That sounds like a lot. 60% of those reside in the ARC, so in the Guard and Reserve. 
what some of my combatant command SEL partners presented to me sometimes was, hey man, you have this many, why can't we get some of that? Why are you telling me you can only offer this day to day? Well, understanding that we have a certain percentage in depot, we have a certain percentage that are on training tails, we have a certain number of those assigned to CENTCOM, we have a certain number of those prepared to support the National Mission Force of United States Special Operations Command or United States Strategic Command. Okay, cool, Jay, that's great. You got the math there, but why can't we just mobilize? Well, when you look at Russian doctrine, mobilization of our forces to them is considered escalatory. And I think the folks who here is at Ramstein. I'm not sure if you would all appreciate what Russia might do if we start to mobilize our arc to move forward. But understanding some of those things uh, is very important so you can explain the why behind it. Now let's talk about understanding relationships in the operating environment. Up, down, and lateral. Understanding the equities of each of the services was very important to me. Understanding their culture, understanding those hot topics that are going on. And also understand how I support or United States Transportation Command supports the other combatant commands and what they need from me. And getting and establishing and building personal relationships with them so we build on that trust. So we know when times start to get tough that if I'm sharing a piece of information it's because even if it's bad news, it's coming from a place of understanding, it's facts, it's real, it's not that I don't want to support you, it's that we can't right now, and here's why, and here's what the break glass plan is, and here's when we're going to get to you. And I'll share an example, uh, a COVID example, a little bit later in the brief that talks about where I had to leverage many of these things that we're talking about right here. Now, understanding authorities. Now, what authorities does your organization have is extremely important. What authorities of others you need, whether that's services or other combatant commands. I was very fortunate in U.S. Transportation Command because our combatant commander had all the authorities he needed, short of mobilization of the reserves, which is a presidential decision. We had everything we needed. My partner over in U.S. Cyber Command had to worry about so many different authorities and permissions to operate in their battle space that we were in two completely, absolutely, completely different worlds. But it's very important to understand in the joint world, as a joint enlisted leader, what you have, what you need, and how your actions impact others. Also understanding, and this is a, a kind of a common misunderstanding, the difference between service responsibilities to operate, train, and equip, and combatant command responsibilities to actually execute the mission. It was surprising to me how many of our airmen did not understand what a combatant command is, what a combatant command does, and what the services do to allow those combatant, those combatant commands to execute mission. And to shift as a leader from growing up in an operate, train, and equip world to a world where you don't need to be as concerned about those things as much is, uh, could be a bit of a challenge. Um, and then some opportunities. All of these things I just talked about you know, definitely affect your people's ability to do what they need to do. Again, if it's important to you and you talk about it, it's going to be important to them. I also want to talk about some misconceptions and gaps in there that that could exist from time to time if you step into the joint world or even in your organization. Pulsing those things, understanding those things, gathering those commonly asked questions or those misunderstandings from your, the other leaders in your formation, whether that's another combatant command, that's another service element, and reaching out and answering those things for them and raising that level of understanding. Now, I had the opportunity early on to pay attention to those things that people didn't understand about the command or what it is that we did. So hosted a senior enlisted leader, 
symposium where I invited all of and this is something you all can do as well in your formations, on your installations, bring everybody in to raise their level of understanding on what it is you do and why. Understand their perspectives, understand what they need from you, understand what you provide them and clarify those things. Again, building relationships, and I'll get to that definitely here in a couple slides. Understanding the organization. All right, Chiefs, this is where you make a whole lot of money. And I've heard a lot of discussion this week about cultures and norms. And one of the most common questions I got as a joint senior enlisted leader is, hey, what do you expect out of an airman in the joint world? What do you expect out of a soldier, sailor, marine, coast guardsman in the joint world? Well, it's not deep. It's not mysterious. I expect you to be an awesome airman. I expect you to be really good at what it is that you do. I expect you to understand what those institutional competencies are, what the Air Force does. I expect you to know what those functional competencies are that you do in your particular craft. Then I expect you to adapt to the situation. I expect you as an airman to step up and represent the Air Force. Honest opinion, we're a little too quiet as airmen in the joint world. We have so much to offer. You have so much to offer. But what happens from time to time is folks get a little hesitant in that joint community because they think the other services are better prepared for them. Yes, they train differently. Yes, the Army might understand doctrine a little bit more. They might have a little bit more depth of knowledge in the Army's competencies than the Air Force does with ours because they focus on that. But what I will offer is our airmen, without a doubt, have the greatest ability of all services to think through problems. And I don't say that in a disrespectful manner towards the other services, but when you throw a problem, a challenging thing at an airman, they will absolutely, in most cases, outperform our other folks. Because our ability to innovate, our ability to think, how we change and how we evolve much more rapidly, it might feel slow at times, but when you look compared to the other services, our ability, again, to think, to maneuver, to innovate, we are far ahead of those folks. And I would really, really love it if the Air Force took more of a stand. Be proud of who you are. I also, when people would come into the command, would have the discussion on what expectations are, I expect you all to maintain that swagger, that service pride, those service norms, that culture. How many people in here have served in a joint organization before? All right, that's a lot of hands, that's good. Going in there, I made the mistake as a tech sergeant to really focus on the jointness, to focus on pretty much being Army. I'll just be honest. As a young person in the special operations community, I lost my identity as an airman. Became very, very good at what I was doing down there at the time, but I had a hard time going back to Big Blue as a master sergeant after three and a half years, and the Air Force had passed me by, and it took some catching up to do. But what I also didn't do was fully represent my services I should have as a young person and speak up from time to time and stand up for what the Air Force brings to the fight. So just something to think about uh, with your folks. All right. So the people part of it, you know, talked about that. Um, understanding, you know, assignments, what value is placed from the services, um, because each service values it, it differently. And these are some leadership challenges that you're going to have to come through. If you have a person in a joint organization, realistically, we have already gotten past the service issues. We have already gotten past that training piece. We have already gotten past all the things that are in your world every day. It is mission execution time. 
And understanding things about services as a joint senior enlisted leader is hugely, hugely important. Um, let's talk about structure a little bit. Understanding our structure, of course, is, you know, is hugely important. You have the ability here as a chief or as a senior enlisted leader to impact this a lot. Knowing where to go to get what information, how processes and timelines work. For example, here's another transcom example. Deployment validation timelines. When requests come in for those things to get approved, for those things to move through jokes. Again, I'm not going to talk about all that stuff today. For that process to move through, there are some expectations out there. I got beat up by, I don't know, probably every command sergeant major in the Army calling me direct, hey, I'm this unit downrange, and you guys are failing to get us home on time so we can reset and redeploy and move forward. Hey, roger that, Sergeant Major. Let me just hop on this right quick, the access I had. Well, here's the deal. Y'all were 37 days late on getting that in the system, and we're going to get to you but it's probably not going to be today. You all failed to do the right thing to get those things in there. I think if I would not have known that, I would have made some pretty big mistakes. If I would not have understood those timelines, and it's important for you all, and I'm just using that as an example, it's important for you all to understand what those processes are that other people are relying on you for um, within your organization and your structure. The physical layout especially if you have the opportunity to stand up a joint task force or you go into a joint command. We learned an incredible amount, of course, through COVID, through surges, through hurricane responses. And what we learned, and I share this with you to hope that you'll take a look at this, what we learned is our structure in our operations center was not efficient. We were structured by joint directorates. We had our one, our two, our three, you know, all the way through the numbers. And each had a clean little area and cubicles, and any time we would stand up for a crisis or a conflict, we would restructure things and we would move together as a cross-functional team, or we would do things differently. And when we actually looked at it, we're like, well, why aren't, it, why aren't we structured this way from day to day so when we actually have to execute or we have to do things, we're already set up for efficiency. So just something to, uh, to take a look at with the structure. Authorities, you know, I talked a lot about that uh, earlier. I would say as far as understanding the organization with authorities, one thing that we don't typically do as airmen or within our structure is a chief of staff. Um, you know, definitely learn what authorities they have, learn what they do for the staff, and uh, see how you can, you can leverage with those folks. And then the service elements, there was some discussion in here also about, um, yesterday it was about evaluations and, and leading folks that are um, in a joint environment. Understanding who to go to and what authorities exist in the service elements. You will have a commander of each of those particular service elements, so for all of the Army, yes, they're gonna be distributed out in the joint directorates, but they're gonna have a service element commander they're going to have a service element senior enlisted leader, if you choose to do so, um, to designate that. Know where to go and know what authorities those folks have and service reportings and what is important to them um, and how you can, of course, leverage that as a senior enlisted leader. All right. Now, let's talk about, this is where I want to spend some time, where we talk about operationalizing our culture and our climate and our relationships, and our communication. This, Chiefs, is where you are going to make your money and add the great value to the organization. We have talked a lot of, about a lot of things this week. We've had great presentations and great information sharing. And I challenge you all to think about those individual topics we have talked about this week and what that means, how you're going to operationalize all of those things to affect readiness, to affect mission outcomes, 
Again, this is where we're going to ask that second and that third why. Why is it important for us to have connection with our airmen? Why is it important for us to have a strong culture? Let's talk about culture for a minute, or that connection piece. We talk a lot about that in the Air Force. Here's the rest of the narrative that I would really like you all to carry. What next? To what ends? Now, we have done a great job, great job for our airmen in recent years for breaking down barriers that allow them to reach their full potential, to allow them to feel valued, to allow them to express their individuality. We have broken down barriers for assignments. We are redoing a lot of things. We are focusing on what keeps our airmen. We are focusing on how do we retain this talent. What I don't hear a lot of is why. To what ends? When, chiefs? Do we come to a point where we start to get a return on that investment? And all of those investments that we have made, it is in very, it's very important for you all in the room to draw those things to mission outcomes. To really frame how you communicate when we talk about retention. Why is that? Why are we talking about retention? It's so we can affect mission outcomes. It is so we can defend the United States of America. It is so our services can support the missions of the combatant commands that are going to put these folks in harm's way or could. So please really think about the next why and the next why when we talk about some of those things. Where I would really love for you all to focus, and this is hard to say as an airman, but I got to say it. I really hope that you all will focus on ensuring that our airmen don't fall into a culture of entitlement and understand that the reason we are doing things is really in the defense of our nation and to be really good, of course, at what it is that we do as a credible combat force to deter and defeat our enemies. Yes, it's great that our airmen feel valued. It's great that we have done so many things to improve their quality of life. And they are treated much better than many of us, probably most of us were coming up. But it's actually beyond those things, the reason why we do that. So please, make sure our airmen understand that these things are to promote a culture of service and not a culture of entitlement. And I could really, I think all of us could really use your help on that. So as far as operationalizing those things, you know, we talked about culture. Um, you know that connection, of course. We can go to trust. Having that trust, earning that trust, maintaining that trust is going to make those hard times better. It's going to allow you as a senior enlisted leader to deliver those hard messages and get those airmen to do very difficult, emotional, hard things when we have to do what we do as airmen to affect mission outcomes. The relationships, the communication, how we do all those. Again, when we talked about operationalizing culture, relationships, when I talk about communication, it's, again, sharing those things. Now, when I look at how we leverage social media, there is an opportunity here as far as the way you communicate culture relationships and all those things. There is an opportunity here that I think sometimes we don't take full advantage of. And here's what I see sometimes. 
organizations, and this is not just the Air Force, organizations will go out on visits, they will engage with their people, they will take happy pictures, they will put stuff on TikTok, they will do all kinds of, I'll call it the way it is, feel good things. Which is great. It builds that trust, it builds that connection, it reinforces that connection. But how we message that is important as well, to tie in the why it is that we're doing, or what it is that I'm doing out here. I'm not going halfway around the world to engage with these airmen just for the sake of engaging with those airmen. I'm going there for strategic reasons, for outcomes. Again, how you as a chief put the narrative on that is important. Okay, I went to this base to engage with this organization because their importance in their combatant command's mission or in the defense of the United States, that's why I'm there. Adding that little bit of narrative into that and the way you communicate is also going to reinforce to your airmen the importance it is of what it is that they do every single day for our nation, for your combatant command, for your organization. doesn't matter if it's joint or if it's Air Force. Now some, uh, some observations. Um, just, you know, I'll share a story about relationships and how important those things that I had built with our service senior enlisted leaders, senior enlisted advisors, our combatant command, senior enlisted leaders as well. And I will use that COVID example. And this was without a doubt the most challenging period in my 31-year career when the world opened up on my boss and I for good reasons. And I survived that, our command survived that, based on relationships. So when that kicked off, and I had to actually write it down, we were still supporting combat operations, sustaining things in CENTCOM. We had to deploy the comfort and the mercy, chop those over to NORTHCOM. We had to help NORTHCOM stand up all the hospitals across the United States. We still had to have clean forces to support the national mission force for US SOCOM, for US STRATCOM. We were still responsible for global patient movement. We were still responsible for household goods during a stop move and different service interpretations of those things. We were still responsible for deploying folks around the world from our ports on the east and west coast. Um, and we had to maneuver through that with different service interpretations of guidance, services having different requirements. That was a whole lot going on. We were unable to do every single thing that we had to do. So the relationships that I had when I had to make the hard calls with some of the services, hey, your folks are showing up to our ports unprepared to deploy without their tests, without this or that. The countries that these folks are going to are not going to allow them in there Here's what I need from you, having those hard, hard conversations. Hey, CENTCOM, we're going to have to lay off your capability a little bit because we are doing this. Every single day in communication with my counterpart at NORTHCOM, who was probably a little bit more stressed out than us, we had to make a lot of hard decisions and tough calls that could have caused significant stress across the Department of Defense between other combatant commands, between the services, and what it was that carried us through were those relationships that we had built before. Not on the fly, not after. Chiefs, build those relationships because you will not get to pick, or may not get to pick, the time that things go wrong all of a sudden and you become critically important to everyone else. Um, leadership presence. Uh, I'm sorry, the gap seams and silos. Um, understanding, of course, within your organization and outside of your organization where those rubs are, as any senior enlisted leader should do. Understanding where those rubs and those gaps and those seams are. 
um, and getting after that. Comfort in crisis, an observation that is important to share for those of you that have, have worked in joint or those of you that might before. Sometimes there's a little competition in service ways of doing things. And when things start to get really tough, your presence is going to be very important to be observant to the fact that folks in a joint environment might go back to their service ways very quickly and their norms. Rather than come with a joint solution, they're going to recommend a service solution, um, something to really think about in the joint world. Probably the best example I have of that is actually back as a young master sergeant in Joint Special Operations Command. We had to make some basing decisions to open up uh, places for soft forces to operate out of. And we have an organization within the United States Air Force. Uh, I was a operations NCO, of course, as a defender, the security guy for the command. Hey, let's use this organization down at Moody Air Force Base that does just that. They do that exact thing for the Air Force, for the joint force, but the decision was made not to use that because of the Air Force's structure, the lack of depth of understanding for the senior folks within there. They chose to go to the easy option, which was the Army option. It turned out not to be the right option, and there were some challenges a little bit later. So just something to be aware of in that comfort and crisis. And that leadership presence that I talked about, and I'm not only talking about that physical presence, but some of the things where you can add value. You as a senior enlisted leader have an access to the boss. There's power in that, but it, always, it doesn't always have to be that. So your relationship with the other directorates, depending on where you're serving, these could very well be general officers, you have a responsibility to protect them as well, to take care of them. If you're on the road, whether it's with your boss or on your own, and you hear a little something that might be important, first option shouldn't always be go to the boss and tell him or her. Have the courage to call that individual and say, hey, you know, I'm over here in Kuwait, I'm over here in Qatar, we got some challenges over here with this, get it sorted, you don't need, of course, to tell the boss everything. Preventing groupthink. So I will say some of your leadership presence Part of that is, is being bold. You will experience, if you have not already, when the boss starts to say something, the tendency for everybody around him or her is to agree with that in many cases. You as a chief master sergeant, you don't have any more promotion potential. You don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. Those other people in the room do. You have an opportunity there to be that bold leader and make sure that that groupthink does not lead to a poor decision. Because believe it or not, the further you go, the less your bosses really want to decide on things. Their headspace needs to be elsewhere, and they need to have options presented to them by others to execute. They don't want the good ideas. I don't know how many times I've had the privilege of working for three, four stars. I don't know how many times we've walked away and he's like, Chief, what the hell was that? Why was I driving that bus? Where was so-and-so? Okay, Roger, sir. I would hear that once, but I certainly wouldn't hear that again because as a chief, I had to shape that environment to make sure that those things simply do not happen. One of the biggest examples, and you don't know also when you're going to get put on the spot and you might have to be that one voice of reason, regardless of the seniority of the folks in the room. And I got set up, I got, I basically I walked into a trap that our previous Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force set for me. And General Goldfein set for me. And this was one of the hardest, and I ain't going to lie, you know, I just had the opportunity over time to work around a whole bunch of GOs. But this one, oof, my legs were shaking. I had the opportunity, I got an invite from the previous Chief of Staff of the Air Force to join Corona. 
when they were talking about a global contested logistics tabletop. I had been at United States Transportation Command for three or four months, and hey, let's get a couple chiefs in the room. So you had myself, the Air Mobility Command, Command Chief, and the Command Chief from the 18th Air Force. We're the only chiefs in the room. All the MAGCOM commanders, our chief of staff, secretary was in there, all of the, uh, the A staff folks were in there. And we talked about the logistics and deployment scenario that the Air Force would have to go through. But the challenge was, this came from tip fit delivery on. So all of the things to the left of that, as far as aggregating forces at the power projection platforms, getting across the ocean, whether that's surface or air, all that's notional. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the hard thing right here. That is the forward movement of troops to contact once everybody gets in theater. Well, it was great. Very worth the time, the effort. Uh, the A4, who used to be the previous vice commander that I worked with when I was the AFMC command chief, uh, great relationship. It was awesome. And then the chief goes around the room and says, all right, chief, what, what do you guys got over there? The challenge that I had, and this goes back to understanding the environment, understanding the organization, understanding the structure, understanding the relationships, and understanding the authorities, is that when we deploy to a high-end fight, our reliance on our commercial partners to move 90% of our stuff and 90% of our passengers, not on military aircraft and ships, all on commercial that live outside of the DOD information network, that have to have a certain presentation of sequence and timing to get to the fight at the right place at the right time. When we look at what China can do, if we question any of our data integrity when we are moving 15 brigade combat teams, 21 fighter squadrons, depending on what fight we're talking about, that stuff matters. And when the chief asked if I had any thoughts on this, well, sir, yes, I do. This is great. When are we going to talk about the challenge that our cyber professionals, not the pointy stuff, not the cool stuff, not the sexy stuff, the kinetic stuff, when are we going to talk about logistics and cyber? Because if any of that fails before we get to this point, this is a worthless exercise. And wow, um, like literally, was shaken when I said that. And I look at some of those MAGCOM commanders looking at me. I, I look at the A4, and he's just like, really, Chief, you just did that to me? But said what I had to say and said what I needed to say. And this is not about me. This is about you and being a bold leader. But what that led to is the important piece. Because our chief of staff took that very seriously. And the engagements became even more frequent with the Air Force chief of staff. Their relationship became more communicative and more frequent. U.S. Transportation Command's relationship with U.S. Cyber Command to try to solve some of those problems that I mentioned became stronger. Again, this is not about me. This is an example of how your bold leadership as chiefs can really get after some important things if you understand some of that stuff that I talked about earlier for your unit and you can speak from a position of knowledge and power and know what the hell you're talking about. All right. So, that leadership presence too, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about um, that social media piece as well. Leverage that, chiefs. There are a lot of us that choose, and I'm guilty of it as well, I don't like to see my face out there because, as many of you are, we talk about being humble, we talk about being servant leaders, 
We talk about the importance of giving the attention to our airmen or our soldiers, sailors, marines. We talk a lot about that, but understanding and embracing the power that exists in our presence online as well. And this is not only with our U.S. forces, because also, you know, we, we have some smart folks, some of you in here probably have dealt with this, to figure out what our adversaries are watching, to know that you are going to be looked at by our adversary. Your message is going to be read by our adversary. Yeah, that's a little bit risky. It might be a little bit scary for some, but it's an important message. And I didn't fully understand this until I went on a partner visit over at Azerbaijan, which is a country that we rely on for access basing overflight. Went over there and met with them. And I had the opportunity to meet with the SEAC equivalent-ish uh, gentleman over there, and he's like, hey man, you know, I got on your LinkedIn, I was looking at that, I got on the page, I Googled you, you know, I, I watched a couple of your presentations when you were at Air Force Materiel Command, and I'm like, oh my God, how does this guy even know what Air Force Materiel Command is? He's like, what you said here resonated with me? What you said here, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Okay. Wow. So that presence online sends sometimes a message of reassurance to our partners and allies. And also, that leadership presence. When you go to another nation in any capacity and you're standing there with your boss, what that does for our allies and partners is absolutely huge because the value that other countries place on their enlisted force is not the same as us. But so many of our partners and allies are watching us as the example. And an example that I will share with you, when my previous commander and I went and visited the Philippines, we went to Clark Air Base, or what used to be Clark Air Base. My boss, he was an Army guy, used to having his command sergeant major next to him all the time. Good feeling, because we're moving through that space. We walk into a room with the uh, Philippine Defense Force or Philippine uh, Military Force, met with all the senior leaders from there. There was not one enlisted person in the room. We walk up. I'm like, hey, sir, you know, I'm going to sit over here. He's like, no, nope, we need to get a spot for my chief up here. Um, got it. Within about 10 minutes, there was an action officer rushing out and bringing in some enlisted folks um, you know, from the room, there was a, and, and their rank is the same as Air Force rank, except the stripe is upside down. So there was a, uh, a guy that came in with upside down chief stripes on, and he sat at the table, and the interpreter came up. He's like, thank you so much for this. I hadn't really thought much about it because I was so used to it. But your leadership presence with your boss sends a message too. And one of the greatest, and I don't know what this guy's doing, Right now, uh, had the opportunity to spend some time with the Ukraine SEAC, or their equivalent is the Sergeant Major of the uh, Ukraine Military Forces, um, to share some perspective with him. I wish I could reach out to him right now, but he was also watching and valued, and I can't imagine what is going through his mind right now and what challenges he is facing right now. But that trust that some of our allies and partners have in the leadership, enlisted leadership of our force is hugely important. All right. I'm going to finish with some resources. Now, again, I, didn't, I said I wasn't going to hit you with a whole bunch of joint doctrine stuff, but if you're looking for a starting point to understand where you ought to be thinking about if you're going to be going into a joint organization, it's right there. Recently published called the Command Senior Enlisted Leader. It's on the NDU website, National Defense University website under Keystone. You can Google it. That's the first thing that pops up if you type in the Command Senior Enlisted Leader, fourth edition. That will help you out. Joint Operations, fifth edition. That's actually from 2017. But it will explain to you the structure of a joint task force, who is responsible for what, how the government works to some extent. Um, and then also Joint Forces Quarterly is a 
course, quarterly publication that National Defense University pushes out. All of those can be found on uh, joint uh, jcs.mil under doctrine. Um, you guys will have access to these slides so you can look it up. If you're interested, I would recommend, even if you're not going into a joint assignment, to take a look at that command senior enlisted leader. It is very enlightening. It is very helpful. It kind of illustrates what right looks like. And uh, definitely think you ought to take a look at that. And this is what we talked about. We don't have time for discussion, but I will be here the rest of the day. I will be up here at break. If any of you have anything that you would like to discuss, there's my contact information as well. Please, at any time, and I mean this, might take me a minute, hit me up if there is anything that I can help you with, with some of the things I scratched the surface on today, with any of those other things, please, please do not hesitate to hit me up. I'm still bleeding blue, even though I'm not wearing a blue suit, but that's because Todd is wearing his, and he went before me, so all good. But thank you all so much. I wish you the best on your journey as Chief Master Sergeants. I am jealous. I am excited for what you're going to do to our people, and I wish you and your families all the best. Thank you so much. All right, real quick, y'all, I know some of you guys got to run out, but let me say this. So, one, you know, I, I got a lot of things from hearing Chief Retire Jay France speak, but the one thing that always stays with me is relationships matter more now than they ever have before. Like, relationships matter at every level that you serve at. So, when I was a tech sergeant, and I might actually have to do your homework because I think I was a young senior airman when you were a tech sergeant. Yeah. All right, so, so, so no, I'm just, I'm like, man, I wasn't at JSOC when I was a senior airman. I was a senior airman and a master sergeant and senior. But anyway, relationships at that time mattered. You know, they always do. And the one thing that I have learned throughout my career, and, and, and General Brown spoke about it a little bit as well, is like the keys to success are surrounding yourself by people who are smarter and more talented. So I always kept folks like Jay France in my hip pocket. Whenever you need to have somebody who's highly competent in joint operations or highly just a strong, badass leader, who by the way, went to Ranger School, you know, but when you need somebody with some operational credibility, you call up folks like Jay France. And so in your Rolodex chiefs, of people that you have, you always have to have strong leaders and different skill sets. And to that end, brother, thank you for continuing to pour back. Thanks for your love for our Air Force and our airmen. Let me give you, did I give you my coin? No. All right, good, here you go. <laughs> Very cool, awesome, thank thanks you. brother. Thank Absolutely. Hey, and real quick, I was remiss. I did not get an opportunity to also give some love and give my RMO to Chief KP when it comes to relationships. And I feel kind of bad because the last two days, KP's been dressed like British royalty. <laughs> and, and now today, we just looking cool. So c come on over here. And, and, and when again, relationships matter. When I, when I thought about who do I want to invest into this group, and talk about where we need to go from a strategic perspective. Like, I thought of nobody else than Chief KP who can talk strategy, but he can also break it down how it's applicable to every, everyday people. So to you, brother, appreciate you. Thank you. So awesome. Appreciate All right. Cool. All right.